Good morning, everybody. And I'd, re I'd like to welcome you to our uh, leader in residence uh, with featuring Sandra Wojtis. And I know you've all received her bio and all that, that describes all her significant accomplishments. But I wanted to sort of give you a little bit of a, a personal touch to how I know Sandra. I met her, I had the pleasure of meeting her about 10 years ago, actually. It is 10 years ago, over 10 years ago. It's hard to believe. Uh, and I was in, in the uh, Leadership Edmonton program, and our learning group was planning uh, and leading a, a learning day on um, uh, personal responsibility in March of 2004. And we asked Sandra, and she agreed to be our speaker for that, for that day. And our, as I said, our topic was on personal responsibility. And we were ex exploring with our cohort um, what accepting personal responsibility meant, um, when an individual sees really what needs to be done and then in a community and does it without being asked or being told what to do. And I actually still have our little outline from two th March 2004. <laughs> I know. Uh, so <laughs> I still remember... Uh, it, it, how much in awe I was after listening to Sandra speak. Her vibrancy, her b brutal honesty, her passion for our kids, and her love of learning, and her wonderful sense of humor. Um, really, she was the poster girl, is the poster girl for, for, um, for, make, for Leadership Edmonton's personal responsibility theme. She illustrated how she made a choice to make a difference using the example of her leadership of the City Centre Education Project only one area where Sandra's made a huge difference in our community. And for me, um, watching what she's accomplished over the last 10 years, Sandra really epitomizes the leader who accepts personal responsibility, sees what needs to be done, and does it. So please join me in welcoming Sandra Wojtas. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pilar, you're pathetic. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Pilar was 12 at the time. That was like 10 years ago. Okay. It's great to be here. I need a timekeeper. Michael, will you be my timekeeper? Michael is actually my boss. He's on the Board of Trustees for Edmonton Public. And I'm an agent of the board, so I better be on my best behavior. So there goes up with three quarters of my speech. Okay. Anyway, will you tell me when time, about 10, 15, what, 10 o'clock, Pilar, 10, 15? Okay, about 10 o'clock, say Sandra, <laughs> and then we'll, we'll play it by ear. How is everyone this morning? Okay, good. Very convincing. Thank you. Very convincing. Um, first of all, you need to know I love EPL. You've heard me say this before, and I will continue to say it over and over and over again. You are unsung heroes in this community. Absolutely, unsung heroes. I admire you for what you do. You make such a difference throughout this city, and you make me so proud to be an Edmontonian. So thank you for each and every, each and every. And I want to thank, there was a gal today where I was lost in the parking lot. It was a good EPL employee. Was that, thank you, because I was kind of pathetic down there, wasn't I? <laughs> you know, they'd be going to talk women. And I still want those ducks back. Remember the old, I can remember those ducks. Pilar, were you the one that got rid of those ducks? Okay. Anyway, I remember those days from a long time ago. Um, I'm going to begin with a prayer. And it's a prayer for children. I need to have a little drink here. And then we'll be fine. We pray for children who sneak popsicles before supper, who erase holes in math workbooks, who can never find their shoes. And we pray for those who stare at photograph photographers from behind barbed wire, who can't bound down the street in a new pair of sneakers, who never counted potatoes, who are born in places where we wouldn't be caught dead, who never go to the circus, and who live in an X-rated world. We pray for children who bring us sticky kisses and fistfuls of dandelions, who sleep with the cat and bury goldfish, who hug us in a hurry and forget their lunch money, who squeeze toothpaste all over the sink and who slurp their soup. And we pray for those who never get dessert, who have no safe blanket to drag behind them, who watch their parents watch them die, 
who can't find any bread to steal, who don't have any rooms to clean up, whose pictures aren't on anybody's dresser, whose monsters are real. We pray for children who spend all their allowance before Tuesday, who throw tantrums in the grocery store and picket their food, who like ghost stories, who shove dirty clothes under the bed and never rinse out the tub, who get visits from the tooth fairy, who don't like to be kissed in front of the carpool, who squirm in church or temple or scream on the phone, whose tears we sometimes laugh at and whose smiles can make us cry. And we pray for those whose nightmares come in the daytime, who will eat anything, who have never seen a dentist, who aren't spoiled by anybody, who go to bed hungry and cry themselves to sleep, who live and move and have no being. We pray for children who want to be carried, for those who must, for those we never give up on, and for those who don't get a second chance, for those we smother, and for those who will grab the hand of anybody kind enough to offer it. We pray for all children, amen. Now, praying for children is one thing. So how do we put in an action plan to get all our children and our youth ready for the 21st century? And how do we do this for the city of Edmonton? So how do we get our children and youth to make the world a better place in the 21st century? Now I am reminded about something a fellow recently said about Canadians. There is a sleeping giant in this country and it'll be found in the passion Canadian parents and communities have for their children. It's called that social trust. We need to really wake that sleeping giant up. In looking at what I want kids and youth to have for the 21st century, I have realized that I'm hoping for the same thing for our children today. And I'm gonna hazard a guess today that much of what I will be sharing will also was hope for children 100 years ago. Now you're thinking, God, she is so dated. Where did Pilar get this fossil from? Uh, because I believe this. I believe that healthy, caring, competent, and responsible kids never go out of style. And I don't think healthy, caring, competent, and responsible adults never go out of style. And they are what make our world a better place and our community stronger. There's a guy, his name is Ralph Waldo Emerson. Many of you have heard from 100 years ago. And one of the things he always says is character is higher than intellect. And how many of us have met people of high intellect with absolutely no character? Think about that. And in fact, when I look at the world today, I don't think our kids and youth need family and community more than they do now. And I'm talking here about the personal time that you and I spend or don't spend encouraging and supporting our communities and kids. And I think we really need to get back to that. Or at least understand today why people do not feel empowered to take personal action in a society which seems to be organized around services and not around communities. And it's time for all of us to become a more, more passionate about our young people and to make it a goal that every child and young person experiences many points of formal and informal relational support on a daily basis. And for some kids and youth, you're the only ones. It's not about technology. And for all you techno guys out there, I'm breaking your hearts, it's not about technology. It's about relationships. Good old fashioned relationships. For the children and youth of the 21st century, I want an incredible amount of support that when accumulated over time will create this critical mass of positive nurture. Our kids need it. Our, sheesh, our adults need it. Um, there are so many things today that I, that I find simply unreasonable. Um, adult stats tell us that two out of three adults surveyed don't like themselves. So I'd like you to turn to the person on the left. Come on, active participation here. Okay, look to the person on the right. One of them is it, okay, one of them is it. Here's another, here's some other scary stuff. Eight out of 10 people surveyed don't like what they do for a living. 
So that means that 80% of the workplace gets of the workplace gets up every morning and goes somewhere that it does not want to go. That is why there's probably such road rage in the morning. Anyway, but I'm going to hang on to the belief that this survey wasn't conducted in EPL for Edmonton with Edmonton Public Library, as I believe most of us in this room go to our jobs wanting to be there. Now, however, I firmly believe in the next stat that I'm going to share with you. Now, something happens to us as adults from the time we enter school to the time we become adults. Now, very simple question was asked of kids. And this was done, it, and it was done by Jack Canfield, and it was done in the late, in the early 90s. Very simple question. I love simplicity. I think we've made life way too hard. And we approach things way, ask, making it much harder than it needs to be. Here's all what they said. They asked first grade kids, are you okay? Are you okay? That's all they asked. Are you okay? They didn't define it. They didn't take it to 14 control groups. They did and so this. They just asked kids, are you okay? How many of the grade one kids said, how, what was the percentage of grade one kids who said, yeah, yeah, I'm okay, I'm okay. What's your guess? 100%, wouldn't that be a beautiful world? Okay, I want you, uh, you're, I want your positiveness. I was gonna say you're delusional, but I like that, okay. <laughs> I caught myself, I caught myself. Okay, what do you think it was? Not 100%, what do you think it was? Good girl. Okay, where do you work? Which place? This bill, you get a raise. Pilar, give the girl a raise, okay. And the one that said 100%, give her something too because she's positive and hopeful, okay. We like that. So they found out 80% of first grade kids said, I'm okay, yeah, yeah, I'm okay. Then they asked kids in grade five. They asked kids in grade five. Very simple question, are you okay? What was the percentage? 40, 60, 50, 70. Who said 20? A raise for you. <laughs> 20, Pilar, notice, okay, 20%, okay, 20% of grade five kids said I'm okay. Now they went to grade 12, okay, they went to grade 12 kids, how many of those kids said I am okay? Ooh, who said zero? I want to spend the weekend with you. No, we got to get you feeling better. That's bad. I've got to be more hopeful than that. It's not much higher than that, but it's not quite zero. Okay, send her on a conference. She needs a boost. Okay, okay, what do you think it was? Five percent. Who's at five? Another one, you're gonna be very busy, Pilar, filling out all those coupons. 5%. Now, it makes sense, okay? It makes sense. Um, Andrew, Michael, I'm gonna put you on the spot. Were you around when um, Jean Jean the Dancing Machine was the Minister of Education? Jean, okay. What's it, Jean's was Desky, okay? Anyway, if you ever wanna see a guy that's great with a group of kids, watch Jean's was Desky, he's very good at that. Anyway, um, this was during Jean Jean, uh, when he was a Minister of Education. And they had this thing and it was called, oh, they didn't call it, Oh, it'll come to me later on. This is what happens with menopause. Uh, what happened, they, what they did, they brought all these people together from all over Alberta to talk about why kids were dropping out of schools, were dropping out of high school. And they never called it, they, they made up a really nice name for it rather than calling it, if it looks like a dropout, it smells like a dropout, it's usually a dropout. Let's call it and let's get to the issue as to why these kids are dropping out. But it, they had at the Shaw Conference Center, and it was plush and expensive. They had a guy from a, a Canadian Idol was one of the speaker. Like it was plush, plush, plush. Anyway, it was kind of interesting. Anyway, they had this panel of kids on, and they finally said to these kids, I thought, thank God we're going to the mouths of the babes who should be telling us why they dropped out. Uh, rather than having a bunch of academics who haven't been close to a high school kid in 100 years. Anyway, what, here's what the kids said. They said, uh, they asked, why did you drop out? And it was, no, it, the first thing they did not say was, gee, I wish there was more standardized testing. <laughs> Man, I just wish I was tested more and assessed more and I would have stayed a little longer. You know what they said? They never had one connection, at, they did not feel they had a connection at that school. They did not have an adult connection. 
And I can remember when I took a little detour from Edmonton Public and I went to the dark side. I went to the Alberta Mental Health Board. It was interesting. There was a, a, a principal in Airdrie High School. God, she was great. Older gal, Nancy, I can see her. And what she did is they had meetings where they, they had lists of teachers saying, which kids do you think aren't connected? And they had all those connect those people, those kids connected to either the custodian, the executive, the, the EAs, the teachers, the person who did the cafeteria. Every kid had some sort of connection. Our kids are such dire need of something called connections. Good old connections is all about relationships. I also find it absolutely unreasonable that over 70% of girls in grade four are either dieting or thinking of going on a diet. Shouldn't you be having fun, reading, playing baseball, running around? And what I find even more unreasonable in this country is that there are almost two million children living in poverty. And this is what's going to, sock your, going to knock your socks off. It's an increase of 58% since 1989. In Ukraine, we call that shoza jitko, which means what the devil, <laughs> right? How, what's happening? Now, Edmonton stats, very recent. So the community mapping stuff, which is terrific. One out of four children is living in our city is living in poverty. What does that look like? If we counted one, two, three, four, Pilar, you'd be it. One, two, three, four, you'd be it. That, come on, what's, this is as with the oil reserves we have and all the, all the tech and all the construction and all the work that, I, don't, I can't figure it out. Um, it's also unreasonable that 30% that of young people in Canada are still failing to complete high school. Edmonton Public has done some good work. It's done some really good work to get that to get that to, to get that smaller and smaller and smaller. Now, however, good people like you in this room have also done a really tremendous job of changing that stat in Alberta. And I want to thank you. And I know Pilar's going to roll her eyes if I say this again. EPL has raised many of Edmonton's most vulnerable children. How many here have kids hanging out? at the library at 4 o'clock until 9 o'clock. Hands up. Look at how many hands are up. When I was the principal at Norwood, I know, Pilar, you've heard me say this. Sprucewood, who's here from Sprucewood? Oh, I love you guys. Are you still raising the kids from Norwood? Thank you. You raised a family that I still see, the trans. I, 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 they still talk about how until those kids were in grade 10, they were at the library every night during the week until 9 o'clock. In fact, many of you fed the kids there. And it's not, only, it's not only in the inner city that you guys are raising many children. And I want to thank you for that. People don't get the changing role of the library. Now, we have a lot of kids from wealthy, unsupervised homes, don't we, that are hanging out at the library. And you have them, and you have them in your midst. It was really interesting. I was on a committee. First of all, is anyone here from St. Albert? Okay, no one here from St. Albert? Oh, don't be a chicken. Admit it. No one's here from St. Albert? You're all Edmontonians? Oh, isn't that good? Okay. Um, anyway, I was on a committee. This is a couple few years ago. And it was when uh, community, I think it was lottery grants, where they got local citizens to look at the applications. It wasn't that MLA moment of, you know, here I'm giving money and aren't I a great guy? It was kind of a different process a while ago. And what they did is they got a bunch of us and they were looking at the problem in St. Albert at the time was they had a whole bunch of playgrounds that were being burnt down during the summer. And um, they found out it was from kids who were, who were living in very expensive houses, who were living with, with where there, was very, there was no supervision, because to live in those houses, sometimes mom and dad have to work many long hours. So kids were left unsupervised. And you know what happens when one kid is unsupervised? They find other kids who are unsupervised, and life goes on. So one of the things they were looking at that someone had brought forward, they wanted some feedback on, they wanted to put a street worker in St. Albert. 
put a, a young street worker to work and just try to collect these kids and see what's happening. And at that time, I'll always remember there was a prominent citizen in St. Albert, and to which she said, and I said, wow, I said, that's a really good idea. It's a, you know, she says, but obviously, dear, she says, you don't understand St. Albert. We have no social problems. <laughs> okay? Every, every, every socioeconomic group has a social problem. Okay, we're fine. There's a whole bunch of kids who are wealthy and unsupervised who are getting into some really delicious, interesting things. Now, back to things unreasonable. And you guys, I want some feedback on this. I think the stat's wrong. The average teen spends less than 17 per week in meaningful conversation with their parents. I believe that. Yet by the time they graduate from grade 12, they will spend nearly 15,000 days in front of a television set. Okay, here's a stat I'm questioning. Hours online has been, has been estimated at 35 hours per week. Do you guys think that's too low? Yeah. Okay, Michael, you're a hipster, you're young. What do you think? Too low? Think it'd be higher than 35 hours? Yeah. I, anyway, because every time you look, they're always, I don't know why they, they're not getting hit by cars. <laughs> Gee, I'm old. I don't get that. Because can't anyone look up once in a while? They're, you know, we're, and I do it. I'm guilty of it as well. Okay. But we've got, so, but that's what, but here's what really gets my oversized knickers in a real knot. Um, I find it unreasonable that kids on, are on chat lines with other youth across the world and they can't even conduct a simple conversation eyeball to eyeball with their next door neighbor. Okay? I purposely stalk the kids in my neighborhood <laughs> and I purposely make them look at me and have an eye to eye conversation. Okay? Because it's even more frightening when these kids become our bosses. Okay? So we got to get the people part into the people business. Are we agreement on that one? We got to get back to the people part in business. Now I'm reminded of the time that I spent on the dark side in government when there was a person who was promoted to a department called something ridiculous like people works and someone who couldn't carry a social skill in a bucket got promoted to it. And I can always remember thinking, don't you have to be a people first? in order to be in the people business. And that still astounds me. Um, but okay, back to what I want for kids and youth and families in the 21st century. So how do we make the world a better place? Well, I want all the children who enter the doors of your homes and your libraries and your buildings to be okay with being okay. Okay. We have to teach people all sizes, all shapes, all ages to affirm that they have strengths. Change begins at home with each one of you. Now, change begins with you affirming that you have strengths. In order to, to bring any kind of change or any kind of influence, you have got to affirm that you have strengths. That's what makes a good leader and gives us a platform to influence from, knowing what your strengths are. We ask kids all the time to tell us what their strengths are, and yet we seldom talk about our own. Don't you find that interesting? We're always saying, well, what's your strength? What are you good at? But somehow we don't know how to identify our own. Now, not all of us are Gretzky's, and that's okay. Um, or that skinny American he married that's looking pretty damn good after 25 years of marriage. But anyway, back to our strengths. We're all very, very, we're all experts in this room at pointing out our weaknesses because we fail miserably in affirming that we, have any, that we have strengths. So what I want you to do today, I want you to think about taking charge, taking charge. And we have to be the lead sled dog. Now I want you to get the image, please, of the sled. Okay, the sled dogs, the lead dog. And remember that life is like a dog sled. If you ain't the lead dog, the scenery never changes. Okay, do you get the vision? They're a little slower on the take today, Polar, Polar, how come? Now, where, and also where we are in stages of adult development also, helps and help, also matters in helping us become the lead dog and being influential. Let's look at that. Who here is between the ages of 22 to 27? Oh, isn't that wonderful to see? Okay. He, according to, uh, this is done, this was from uh, Judy Aaron Crump. Um, she does a whole bunch of stuff in HR. Here's what she said. People ages 22 to 27, you're transitional. 
no tenure, risk takers, open to new experiences, here for the moment, believe they can change the world. Hand, put your hands up again. Okay, I want you in my campaign, okay? I want you in my campaign to make, make the world a better place. Now, ages 28 to 35, who's there? Oh my God, okay, listen to you guys. This is ages of permanency. You're exhausted, you're guilty, you get married, you have children, you divorce, you're workaholics. How many here of that group think they're a workaholic? Oh, Michael, get your hand up. Okay, come on, be honest. You're very focused. You stop renting. You start buying. You're stressed. Okay, you're just stressed. Ages 36 to 39. Who's there? 36 to 39. Look at these people. Look at these people. They're in a false euphoria. Okay? <laughs> False euphoria. N not a problem, they say. Not a problem. Not a problem. Quite often, I know when I, when I look around Edmonton Public Schools, where I'm the most familiar with, that's when we usually appoint our new administrators. Okay? They say things like, I took a course on this. I did that. What you do, you got to get these people going because they like to do change. They can do it. They're cheerleaders. Okay? They're kind of our little Dallas cheerleaders. Uh, they can do, they'll do anything. Then comes ages 40 to 6, 46. Who's, the, who's 40 to 46? Okay, I only wish I was 40 to 46. Okay, midlife crisis time. Okay. Body maintenance, things begin to shift. Okay. Um, you start saying things like there's old Peggy Lee song, is this all there is? Okay. Quite often you're thinking, what am I going to do when I grow up? Is this it? And you start looking for new opportunities. Like, this is what I want to do when I grow up. Okay, here's a beautiful two years. 47 to 49. Who's 47 to 49? Okay, a couple of you. Okay. Acceptance. It's a positive time. <laughs> Quite often you'll see people making another commitment. You, you're revived. You want to make a difference. It's going to be a better world. I want you in my campaign as well. Ages 50 to 56. Who's here 50 to... I've noticed some people haven't raised their hands yet. Okay. Okay, 50 to 56. Kind of mellow. You're getting mellow. Show me. Tell me about a kid. I remember we did that when I started in the library in 1980. <laughs> I did that. It's really important we validate these people's experiences because they bring a tremendous amount of wisdom and especially history of the institution. Age 56 plus, who's around? Okay, how old are you? 62. Okay, who, how old are you, the next one? 60. 60, I'll be 60 in December. So we're like the golden girls, okay. <laughs> uh, it's, it's very much an age of ambivalence. Oh, this is also your time to say, my God, she looks good. <laughs> I didn't hear it. Uh, no, no, no. You saw me climb the stairs, it's not pretty, okay. <laughs> Age of ambivalence, conflict. Um, I keep waiting. I'm sure the trustees are all sitting in a room thinking, how much longer is that waitress going to be around? <laughs> like, hasn't her expiry date come up pretty soon, okay? We know how much time is left. Uh, you question, did I make a difference? Did I make a difference? And sometimes you feel that people are waiting for you to move out and move on down, okay? Some institutions are a little kinder than others. So where you are in the stages of development is really important. Now I want everyone who works for EPL to feel okay and affirm that they have strengths. Everyone. Because I want the kids that are coming to your buildings to also feel okay, and I want them to grow up and to be really excellent at something. I also want kids to have fun, and I don't want to let childhood come to a quick end. Uh, what I would like to come to a quick end is a helicopter parent who thinks that hovering over their child 24-7 is a good thing. Um, this has become an industry, and it doesn't serve kids well. Really frightening. Um, when I, We've got two friends that uh, teach um, in the wonderful liberal arts program at the University of Alberta in the Faculty of Arts. Both English teachers, they are bombarded in September by the first, by midterms in October, by parents phoning and saying, how come my kid's failing your course? 
If your kid's old enough to cross the threshold to university, stop phoning the professor, okay? Stop it. These kids need to learn how to be responsible, be competent, be confident, and handle some of the things that happen their way. Um, also, you talk to the former talk to the former registrar at the U of A, where moms and dads are bringing their kids in and questioning why their kid did not get in. Come on, that's not good. Stop it. I know it's very hard, but stop it. There's nothing wrong with kids struggling. In struggling and failing, I want kids to learn to always be hopeful and that they have the inner workings to conquer many of life's challenges. Life's no fun without taking some calculated risks. I'm not talking about jumping out of an airplane. Some of you might want to do that and the Lord go with you. But I'm talking about all of us taking challenges that make us uncomfortable. When I, when, I, when, I, when, I, when I supervised staffs, it was very, if I'm not making your shorts tight, you're not learning. My job as a people developer is to help make people's shorts tight and, and learn new things and start. My job is to make my, my own shorts tight. It's very important. As adults, we need to struggle, and I think it's so good to fail. It's good to fail as long as you can dust yourself off, and continue. Now, I cannot think of anything worse than a kid flatlining through life. I guess I can think of something else. It's an adult flatlining through life, um, especially someone working with children and youth flatlining through life. Now, sure, by flatlining, and you know we've worked with flatlined, flatlining people, you can avoid some bumpy patches, but you will also miss the big payoff the thrill of taking a chance and succeeding beyond your expectations. I have learned a lot more from my failures than I have from my success successes. Now, I want you to start thinking about the risks that you have taken. Now, part of relishing the good news about yourself is based on the risks you have taken in the past and have met with success. Now, when was the last time you truly took a risk? Now, the interesting thing about risk-taking is what constitutes a risk for one person may not conjure up the same personal investment as another. Okay, I want to talk about that. What's the number one fear in North America, do you think? Number one, the fear of speaking in front of groups. Number two, fear of heights. Number three, fear of death. Number four, fear of snakes. Number five, fear of drowning. Number six, fear of darkness. So some people would rather die than speak, and speak in front of a group. Now, I would rather speak in front of a group than try on a bathing suit, okay? In a fully mirrored changing room that's lit by fluorescent bulbs, especially during the month of March, okay? Because I walk in there looking like the underside of a big fat tuna, okay? I just want to regress a little bit. When I was a kid in the 50s, the bathing suit was built to hold back and to uplift, okay? Some of you might remember your grandmas in that, okay? But today's stretch fabrics are designed for the pre-adolescent girl with a figure that's carved out of a toothpick. Now, I have found as a mature woman and as a woman of size, I can either go to the maternity department store, maternity department, and I can buy a floral suit with a skirt. Okay, it's got a big skirt, and I look like the hippopotamus on the Telus ad from that little hippopotamus. Okay, or I can go and select something with stretch material at Walmart. Um, there's so much lycra in the new stretch material now, have you found that? That you can launch small rockets from it. Okay? In fact, I want to share that with the Russians now and the Ukrainians, okay? And I'm surprised our own military hasn't discovered that little nugget yet. Uh, but there you are in this little dressing room managing to fight yourself, into, you're, you're fighting yourself into the bathing suit. And you look for body parts that have escaped, okay? And there's few bits that are willing to stay inside. Everything looks out. And I look like a marshmallow with an elastic band around it. Get that figure. Get that picture. And it's also so high cut in the leg I have to wax my eyebrows to wear it. 
I get so stupid. Okay, but, you know, and that's a risk for you. Like, I'm looking like, Pilar, that's not risky for you, is it? Because you've got legs that go up to your armpits, okay? She's probably parading up and down of Sears. Look at me in the bathing suit, okay? So it's all relevant. You know, it's all relevant. What's a risk for me is not necessarily a risk for Pilar, okay? Now, when I talk about taking risks, I talk about learning new things, trying something different. And I, it does not have to be running a marathon. I change jobs every three to five years if I need to or not. Well, that way people are so annoyed by me, usually by the fifth year it's time for me to get out. But I change, I change jobs every three to four, five years because it's time for me to move on and to give the baton to someone younger, more, more experienced. It's just time to do different things. Now, if someone would have told me in the twilight of my career that I'd be raising money for poor kids to have full-day kindergarten, I would have shaken my head because I think we live in a very affluent province. However, it has been such a great experience. It's turned out probably to be one of the highlights of my career. And I've learned so much. Very, I've learned different things. Now, and I still want public education and I want public libraries to continue to be the force in the 21st century. There is nothing better than the work than public education and public libraries in leveling the playing field for all kids. And it teaches youth and children all about diversity and tolerance. Now, I have no clue what, yet that what children are going to need to be successful in the world 30 years from now. I don't even know what jobs will be available 30 years from now, 50 years from now, 100 years from now. But one of the things I know for sure is that a child will still live to be loved and cared for. We live in a society where we no longer... Hang on, I gotta make sure I got this right. Yep. Uh, we live in a society where we no longer have expectations that anyone other than parents or those paid to work with kids should take responsibilities for the well being of children and adolescents. I wanna see communities become mobilized and committed to unleashing the caring potential of all its residents. I wanna see us driven by a hope that change is possible rather than a sense of despair about entrenched problems. Hope is not a strategy. What's gonna, we need something to happen one action at a time, and I, I'm calling on each one of you to be a character building block in the life of a kid, or in the life of a youth. I want every child and youth to be caressed in enormous levels of love and support. And what's the research telling us? Here's what some of the research, from uh, Resiliency Canada has done some nice work that by grade 12, each youth needs to have the support of at least three or more non-parent adults. Non-parent adults in their lives. I want every child to experience caring neighbors who will take responsibility for mentoring young people's behaviors, not hiding behind their curtains in fear. Have you noticed that in your neighborhood? We, it's really important that we have to ante up but we also have to ante up in who we present as role models. And, and, and I need, let me regress here again. Hang on. It's here somewhere. Let me regress. Now, in 1962, some of you weren't even born in 1962, uh, there was a guy, his name, he was an English professor by the name of Marshall McLuhan. And he gave us the world, gave the world the idea of the global village. Now, in 2013, Toronto gave the Global Village its first, its idiot, called Mayor Rob Ford. May he rest comfortably, I know he's sick. Does not necessarily mean he's no longer an idiot. Okay, here was Ford, crack smoking, public drunkenness, stupor, his stupors, his lies, his many apologies. He made headlines for Canada all around the world. He was the biggest Canadian story receiving six times the coverage of Chris Hadfield's Amazing Adventures in Space. So there's Hadfield. If you guys ever get a chance to hear him, go hear him. He's fabulous. Here's a mechanical engineer, artistic side. His global impact is less than Rob Ford and another erratic Canadian called Justin Bieber. Okay. Our kids are living in a Paris Hilton world. There's no sanction for bad behavior. And I just don't get that. Here's venting from the Edmonton Journal, which I just love. Why aren't people fired anymore? 
like the person who tried to return a pipe bomb to its owner, or Rob Ford are the people responsible for unsecured medic center patient information. Rules of behavior have turned it to mush and society suffers. If this isn't a call for all of us to be the best character building blocks for kids, what is? So how do we influence us from your positions of where you are? Well, number one is adults, we can't wait for people to approve of us. So don't wait around for people to approve of you. I had a friend who used to say, beat the rush, dislike me early, or hate me now. Um, I'm not suggesting that you adopt that approach, but there's some wisdom to it. Happiness is an inside job, and we have to take control. If we are going to be the role models that kids and youth need in our community, we got to try okay. Be who you are. Let it shine. Because when you're an authentic and genuine person, you are going to make an authentic and genuine leader. And you know what our world needs right now? Authentic, genuine leaders who know who they are, who know what they stand for, who know what hill they'll die on, and will, ha and will know that what they can do can really influence the world. It's really important that all of you, I want the world to see you for the unique person that you are. And I want you to relish in that. I also want you to get over yourselves. Sometimes we've got to get over yourselves. I will never be a size five. Okay, I will never be a Pilar. Number one, I'm six inches shorter. And I don't necessarily want to change my lifestyle to that extent in order to be a size five. I want to get healthier. I want to get healthier. Because I don't think my competence depends on my dress size. Nor does my kindness my generosity, and at times I don't know if Oprah is a blessing or a curse. She claims that the new, that 50 is the new 30. I don't want the new 30. I don't want to reinvent myself. What I want to do is I want to take greater charge of the days I have left, and I want to continue to make them better and better and better. And I want kids and youth to see that. I want kids to be healthy, confident, and competent. And I want to see Edmonton Public EPL employees healthy, competent, and confident. Now, may our community be a place where all children and youth are given useful roles. I really believe in this, where they learn competency and they display confidence in their actions. Can we be the role models for that? Where all children, can, well, all children serve in the community for a minimum of an hour a week, regardless if they are 5 or 15, and not because it's an IB or a course requirement. I always get a kick out of the IB requirement. Aren't they wonderful? They're getting credits for it. Of course they're going to be wonderful. How about these other kids who are going to be self-motivated and do it? I look at your libraries as a place where you could do some really great community development work with kids. Absolutely great community development with kids. It can be a place where you can make this, where you can make this happen. Now, I just want to, I'm going to talk a little bit when I was a principal of Norwood School, which was a city center school, and we were always at the receiving end, always at the receiving end. But I made, we made sure that 100% of our kids were involved in a community service, yeah, and even in kindergarten. We made dog biscuits. We did cards for seniors. We did alphabet books for babies at Terra, and then we had... Uh, a gr we had the kindergarten kids make bears, little tiny bears. They sewed little bears uh, to go with the grade four books, for, to go with the baby books, that was the alphabet books for the kids at Terra. I am sure those little babies are still terrorized by the looks of some of those baby bears. <laughs> I know kids did them, but oh, they were terrifying. They were terrifying. <laughs> Nevertheless, kids appreciated giving back. Now, there's always going to be a whole bunch of constipated personalities who doesn't think this matters. Okay? It does when you frame it within the building of social trust. And you'll get my, get, I hopefully you get my drift. Let's not wait around, let's not have kids waiting around for the next handout. What we need to help kids understand is that we're gonna give others the hand up. And how do we continue to give each other the hand up? Now I'm sure that 20 years ago, 20 years from now, 50 years from now, there's still gonna be unwanted pets who need to be walked, babies who need to be held, and seniors who need company. And I think there's a place in your libraries for all of these. 
I can only wish this would not be true, but I feel loneliness and being marginalized will still burden the animal and human spirit 100 years from now. Um, I want everyone to be motivated to do well in wherever they are and to feel okay about doing okay. I want all our young people to be committed to learning, whatever the content may be years from now, but I also want all of you to continue to be lifelong learners. And I know public libraries are up for the task, because your past history is the best indicator of your success. As you know, I love EPL, love EPL. And yes, tomorrow's children are still gonna continue to be technologically gifted, and may the digital divide get smaller and smaller and smaller. I still want kids to read for pleasure, whatever instrument they use to read from. I don't care what the instrument is as long as they continue to read and read. We also know that kids who spend an average of three hours per week on sports, art, theater, clubs, organizations in the community, at the library, or activities in a faith institution have stronger positive values. Oh, I'm talking only three hours per week. Not every last moment scheduled where a kid doesn't know what to do when there's nothing scheduled to do. Have you guys seen the residue of that? Okay, kids don't know how to be bored and how to create on their own and how to just be. Now, in some of the communities, like I know Sprucewood, Highlands, I think probably near Bellmead. What's, what's, what's near Bellmead School? What library? Pardon me? Lois Hole, my guess is you guys are the clubs. <laughs> You're them all. I'm sure you are, because kids may have nowhere else to go. And you are, they're very much depending on you to be that role model they desperately need in their lives. I want to see young people find their own God. I don't care who the God is, I want them to find their own God. I want to see young people also place a high value on helping others, on promoting equality and reducing hunger and poverty. I want to see my neighbors do the same. I want, them, I want everyone to give a damn and vote, especially in Alberta, where our turnout rates are so... Did you guys see in Scotland yesterday? It was eight, what was it? 87%. Holy moly. And, and you know what? For the, that last leadership uh, vote for the PCs, there was more people in the Edmonton Eskimo game than voted. Like, come on, we gotta get we gotta get some civic involvement here. Now, and the voting thing makes me crazy, but I want all children to develop integrity and the courage to act on conviction and stand up for their own beliefs. I want adults to do that. I want adults to stop being fearful of that. To tell the truth when it's not easy. Mm -hmm. And to take responsibility and understand that life is a series of choices. Now, if we want kids today to have strong social competency, then we have to model it, because sometimes it's just not, they're not, it's not there for whatever reason. I also want kids to have empathy and sensitivity and know how to comfort people who are different from them. And I got, I think the most beautiful thing I saw was at the end of June, was it, no, it was the middle of May last year. Um, I'm fortunate that I get to go to lots of schools and I get to see some interesting stuff. Emmy Lazert, North End, they have what's called, is anyone, kids go to Emmy Lazert? Boy, are you happy there? Yeah, did you go to Emmy Lazert? When did you graduate? I can't see you. 92, I got shoes older than you. <laughs> okay, 92 and it was good then? Yeah. Would you send your kids there? Yeah. Good, you still go? Yeah, it's great. Anyway, I went to Emmy Lazert because they have this, cult can you hear me? They have this cultural day. And it's an ethic, ethic, uh, uh, ethic no, what's I talking about? Multicultural day, thank you, God, I knew it was there. I washed my tongue this morning, I don't know what to do with it. Okay, anyway, so what happened is in the morning, all the kids came, they went into little learning groups, they got to taste each other's cultures, food, and talk and stuff, and then they brought all these, how many kids are in a lizard now, 1,700? They brought all these kids into the gym, and I'm thinking, this is gonna be real interesting, right? Now, I'll bring all these kids in the gym because for one hour, hour and a half, they got to present their, culture dance, their cultural dances, our talent, and it was fabulous. So the first kids that came on were from Somalia. I don't think they practiced very much, okay? <laughs> but they were there, they were so proud, and people clapped for them. 
Uh, then the Bollywood people came. Haba haba, they were great. Uh, they had these swords. They were done. Everyone clapped for them. Um, saw another group. They were from Asia <coughs> doing this, this magic thing with these uh, with this with the wire and the rings. Like it's fabulous stuff. They weren't very good. They kept <laughs> dropping. <laughs> uh, anyway, so I'm just waiting to hear someone shout what. You suck! Okay? Because we start, I hear that in blues clubs. <laughs> right? Haven't we seen adults behave this way? Go to comedy. Go to comedy. Go to a comedy place. Anyway, I'm just waiting for some kids to say, You suck, our star. And these girls, they're trying so hard with the, with the string and stuff. Then comes two rappers one black, one white, equally bad. <laughs> they were so bad that I wanted to go up to them at the end and say, please finish high school. You will never survive as a rapper. It was so bad. But what was interesting, no one booed them. Not one kid in that time, and no one booed them. I wanted to boot them out here. <laughs> anyway, I went on and on. There's all different types of dancing and stuff. So I went to the principal, Kim Baxlater, and she's new to Emily Lizard. And there's a strong tradition, a uh, strong history at Emily Lizard. And I went up there and I said, I don't get this. There was no you suck. No one walking out when the talent got real, like those little Asian girls, mm -hmm, and the Somalians going all over, and the two rappers. And she said, and I said, how do you do that? Like, how, how did you do that? Especially adult. Teenagers, right, who are crusty, judgmental, <laughs> right? You, how many here here? Whatever, whatever. Um, I said, what do you do here? And she said, it's what my staff does here and what we model. She said, that's what we do. It's what we model. She said, you notice that we did not all stand there like this. You know, we were in the, she said, we were all in the crowd. But it's what we model day in and day out. And I was thinking, if we can do this with a bunch of hormones on feet, okay, in a large gym, why can't we do that with adults? Are you guys finding adults are rude? Huh? Am I getting old? Go to Walmart. I think the best thing, go to Capilano Walmart. <laughs> Who works at Capilano Library? I go there. How are you? Hey, how's are the gang coming in to see you? Still? That, that whole, that... Mall renovations, that not hurting you or? Oh, uh, we are. Uh, Let's just have a conversation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing what we can. Okay, all right. Uh, what was my point? Oh, go to Walmart on a Thursday night at Capilano. If you want to see and you wonder why kids might not be civil to each other and why we say kids don't have manners, go watch some of the adults lurking in the halls of Walmart <laughs> at 9 o'clock on a Thursday night at Capitol. It's one of my best people watching places. Uh, but we're wondering. Um, it was my point. Okay. I can't remember. Let me get back to it. I love that story. Okay, I'll, I still want kids to view the person, they look, have a positive view of their future. May they be okay with being okay. And kids need to know that their excellence is around the corner. <coughs> I am severely average. I have average intelligence. I have a great work ethic. My parents taught me I got a great work ethic. And I've got the good old smarts that the Creator gave me to surround myself with smarter and more talented people who look at the glass as being half full. <coughs> I have continuously found people who are smarter, more talented, and I surround myself with them because they make me better. And I can learn from them. And you know how a, how a rising tide can bring up the lowest boats? Sometimes I'm the lowest boat, and I hang out. And I have also learned that, very, that laughter is very important. And I hope that kids learn that laughter and a quick wit is really important. How's my time, Michael? Oh, we're doing good here. If you guys uh, think I'm really good, I'll let you out early. <laughs> Am I good? Oh yeah, look at I I know I just like <laughs> Yeah, there's a little prostitute in each one of us, isn't there? Okay. Now I've also okay, but laughter. We need more of it. We know that laughter helps us live longer. And 
If everyone laughed 100 times a day, it would have the same benefit as a 10 mile run. Okay, so guess what I do? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Now, we also know that laughter strengthens the immune system. Read Anything You Can by Norman Cousins, Anatomy of an Illness. Good stuff. Now, laughter can help you deal with the daily stresses of life. The only stress-free day any of you will ever have is the first day they lay you in your coffin. Okay, stress happens. How many here had stress this morning getting here? Okay, pretty happy group here. Where's a gal in the parking lot? I was so glad I was so glad to find you. Okay? I was really happy. Now, I walk a lot. I try to walk a lot. We've always had dogs. Um, the other day I was I thought we live in Rosdale. I thought I'm going to go to Riverdale cuz I want to go up the hill. Anyway, so we were walking in Riverdale and I'm limping. Uh, the dog is walking and we're going and all of a sudden some guy <laughs> passes us in a big car. It almost had fins at the back, so long. It was going, almost had fins in the back. All of a sudden he rolls down the window and goes, hey fatso, you can do it. <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, you know what? I may be fat but I can diet. You're gonna be stupid the rest of your life, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and then I ran like hell. <laughs> Because my legs are like a dash hounds, they start at my knees. Oh, it's running. Okay. Uh, I've never run faster in my life. I just kind of, maybe I should do that more. Uh, I also want you to realize that it's a wise person uh, who knows which bridge should be crossed and which should be burned. Uh, give yourself a break. We really got to give ourselves a break. Forgive yourself for not being perfect. And there's a difference between making a living and making a life. Now, over the years in several positions of leadership, um, I have learned that people have forgotten what I have said, people have forgotten what I did, but people will never forget how I made them feel. And that's always been my barometer. How do I make people feel? I also learned a long time ago is that we need to relish, we need to relish what our strengths are as well as making sure we also have a life outside of EPL, or have a life outside of Edmonton Public Schools. Um, I'm still learning that, it's coming. But one of my proudest accomplishments is not the stuff that Pilar talked about, which was, it's always great to be recognized, but I have the same, we have the same group of friends from 40 years ago. Many of them are the same people. We've been through divorces, suicides, cancer, Losses of, uh, losses of spouses, our parents, um, addictions, many, many things. But, it's, but, we've be, but, I always, but I look at that group as a reflection of my core values. And we, the other day, we, the group of us went out for dinner. And uh, it was dark in the restaurant. And of course, because now we're all between 55 and 65, someone had a flashlight in their, I was so embarrassing, <laughs> had a flashlight in their purse so we could see the menu better, <laughs> along with someone was, and they all started to pass around the flashlight and magnifier glasses. <laughs> to which I said, Oh my God, 40 years ago we were passing around a joint. <laughs> and look at us today, what's happened, what's happened? Now, what, what I'm going to do, I'm gonna, I, can I, you, what should we do? Just do what I wanna do? Okay, okay. Pilar had a whole bunch of stuff for you guys to do later till, uh, till noon or something, I don't know. I don't know if that's necessary, okay? Um, here's what I want to do. Can we, what time is it, Michael? Oh, he read the sign sound or there is a clock. <laughs> How about we have a question and answer until 10.30, we call it a day. Would you guys feel good about that? No? Okay. Here, here's, what Paul, here's what Pilar wants to also talk about. Here's what she said. Can you talk about influence? Yeah, I can. Okay, talk about the risks you've taken, the importance of being brave, and the need for a leader to be true to themselves. Have I covered that? Yes. yes. That's the manager's meeting, it's a separate group. Yeah. Yeah. That's what you want to do? Okay, so these guys can go. Managers stay? Yes. Yeah. Okay, that's what it is. But before I do that, are there any questions from anybody here? 
Any questions? <laughs> Come on, I'm not as nasty as I think. What do you eat for breakfast to get that energy? Pardon me? What do you eat for breakfast to get that energy? You haven't seen me at 12 o'clock at night, have you? <laughs> okay, not pretty. Okay, not pretty. Um, I'm energetic because I love what I do. And I'll tell you why I love what I do and why I'm so grateful. I have been fortunate, touch wood, touch wood wherever it is, I have been very fortunate that I have been able to always work in something that's aligned with my values and aligned with my personality. Okay? And I've had a great run. I started as a special education teacher. I, I was a consultant. I worked um, in a variety of capacities as a consultant. I worked in HR for two years. Not for me. Okay? Not for too much paper. <laughs> Policy. Rule 12, 6, 9, 3, 7, 8. Education Act, me, 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 no, 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 I was fortunate to be a school principal where I, in, inner, in inner city Edmonton where I learned more from the parents and more from the kids and the school family than anything I did in, post -gradu in, in graduate school. I was very fortunate. And then I went uh, in the city center project. I got to work with seven principals. We were truly collaborative before it was even fashionable. Okay? We didn't even know what we were doing was collaborative practice, right? We just thought, how can we, can we start doing, pulling our resources together? Went to the, I went to the dark side. The dark side was interesting. But, we, but what, what, what was interesting about the dark side is I got to travel with a therapist. I got therapy for four and a half years. <laughs> but my energy is so good. But I traveled all through Alberta. Four days a week on the road, did all frontline work, and one of the things I found is every most of the people that I met in Alberta want to make this a great province. They're doing the best they possibly can in making this a great province. Came back to Edmonton, I got a dream job to start something, start a foundation from the basement up. It's been remarkable because you get to see, you get to meet so many people in the community who are like one. That's where I get my energy from. Plus, I've got a good husband. Okay, it helps. I've been married to the same man for 36 years. Okay, um, he doesn't get in my way, I don't get in his. We learn from each other. Um, and so I love what I do, and I love people, and I love this city. I love this city. People are saying, aren't you going to retire soon? Which I am. I'm looking at retirement and doing other things. Um, they said, well, are you going to move somewhere? I said, why would I leave six feet of snow? Because <laughs> I love it here. I think we've got a vibe that's going on. I think we've got some good little hipsters happening. <laughs> we've got some hipsters doing some great stuff. No, we do. There's some great hipsters doing some great stuff that I'm learning from. Okay? This is a great place. That's where I get my energy. But tomorrow I'm at Ed Mud Tunnel all day. Oh, not doing, are you kidding? Yes, I'm gonna run, jump, skip. No, we're the charity of choice. Uh, and then I'm out all day Sunday. I might not be all this perky Sunday night, okay? But I try. Next question. Yes, sir. Uh, this might be a little specific, but uh, you, you talked about kids that, that are chatting across the world but can't hold a conversation. Yes. And a lot, a lot of what kids are coming to the library for is to use our computers. Yep. So how, do you have any ideas for how we can shift that conversation from the screen to Even you the asking the question, I could give you a smooch. You know, life's nego you know, I often think that life is about is about negotiation. Life is negotiation. So one of the things you and I'm sure where are you? What library? Uh, oh God, love you. <laughs> oh, Beacon Heights, I can see all those kids. They, yeah, same thing. You're raising kids. How many kids are you raising each night? Uh, I mean, probably 30. Okay, <laughs> that's the truth. And I don't know why in your advertising campaign for EPL you don't feature that. <laughs> I'm serious. It is so powerful what you are doing. Negotiate with those kids. 15 minutes on the computer and a five minute conversation with me. <laughs> or a two minute conversation. Negotiate something. You know, find out what the kid likes. Could be a book about, could be animals. Say, you know, we'll do 15 minutes, and then I just want to have a quick checkup conversation with you for two minutes. Another thing we need to start looking at, start disguising things. You know, I'll give an example. Um, can I have that chair? Can, I, can we bring a chair up? I have a, I have a sore knee. Um, 
I'm too fat. That's what it really is. <laughs> okay, I need to lose some weight. Um, thank you. That's all I need. You're a sweetheart. How old are you? What? <laughs> <laughs> I can remember I used to bring in four times a year kind of an odd assortment of people to come and I think you have to you have to keep your doors opened and be Shirley Stiles taught me this criticism is a gift hard 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 criticism is a gift <coughs> and I've learned that and I used to call them my criticism is a gift group and I have four different groups come in we go through the school and I'd say I want you to tell me stuff you see here that you think may need to be improved, just from your set of eyes, not an educator's eyes. Just come in, because sometimes there's, little, there's some gems in there, or an opportunity for me to teach, okay? But you've got to be open to that. Anyway, one of the guys, I can still remember him, he's a chartered accountant. I will kiss him too for, for, for saying this to me. Anyway, he says, you know one of the things I notice about your kids, Sandra? Is they're dirty. What do you mean they're dirty? They're wonderful children. They're coming here. They're in the best of possible cat. <laughs> anyway, and I got defensive. I remember getting being a little defensive about it until I started to look at those kids. And you know what? They were dirty. <laughs> a lot of them were coming in. They sm we were so used to them, it became the norm. Okay, so we, a lot of these kids were coming in, didn't brush their teeth, their hair was mad, a whole bunch of stuff. So I presented that to staff and I said, you know, I, I was offended by that. However, what can we do? We started the Looking Good Club, okay? And we started this Looking Good Club where, thank God for great teachers and great staff and, and, and the whole community that was, that whole school family. We began a Looking Good Club where kids thought we invited them in during lunch hour for lunch and a conversation and part of this club was because they were good looking, okay? <laughs> It was called the Looking Good Club. And you know what we did is we taught these kids something called hygiene. Did I ever think in my career, you know, after my career that I'd be having to teach something as basic as hygiene? And we brought different people to come help us do it. Um, and I think at the very end, it was, I think we went to Emmy Lazert, in fact. I think we went to Lazert or something. I think it was Lazert or Ainley because they had a beauty cultures thing and they, Everyone got manicures for a day and this and their hair done. But it just, and we began to see changing behaviors because we provided them with some skills. So you gotta be creative. Does that help you? Yeah. Yeah, just kind of be creative in it. But I really think uh, we need people to have eyeball, eyeball. Like your generation, Michael. Okay? Are they getting, do you think, most of, you, most of your conversations, is it online or is it face to face? Because you're a politician, too. Yeah, I, I, I think I'm a liar. Okay, yeah. I, I it's a mix? It's a mix? Okay. Okay. Anyone else? Yes. Okay. Yes. First Go off, for thank you for laughter. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, hockey practice last night. All the parents were on their freaking cell phones while the kids were on the ice doing the practice. Okay, so that's where they go. <laughs> this is going to be a preamble. I'm involved in a couple of initiatives. Okay where we're planning some training to support staff in encountering individuals who may be facing social challenges. Yes. And as a result, they're bringing behaviors into the library that we might normally say, thou shalt not be in the library okay, because you. you're swearing, you smell bad, yeah. you're doing things, right? Good on you. Okay. Um, what I was hoping if I could get a pithy quote or something <laughs> about that. Okay, Which on the point? Which on the spot? Okay. So as an educator who's working with kids who have faced social challenges, yeah. and I will put to you that the adults that we encounter who are also facing challenges yes. were the kids Absolutely. 20 years ago who were <coughs> facing social challenges. Absolutely. What would you have us say to our frontline staff who are encountering okay. the, these folks in the library okay. so that we have empathy? We okay. think before we open our mouths and spout policy. We try to find a way to keep the kid, okay. to keep the adult in the room. Absolutely. What would you okay. say? 
Here's what I'd say to staff. And I'm going to use a personal example, and then I want you to hold me really accountable to answer your question. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I can remember um, having a, we had, at, when I was at Norwood in particular, uh, we had a parent who used to come drunk to our school. And the parent still came to pick up her kid on time. Kid was always on time. Anyway, um, and mom was interested. It was interesting. It was, just it, was just, it was just interesting. Anyway, and I can remember one of my staff members saying, one of our school families saying, well, what do you expect from the kid? Mom's a drunk. To which I said, the last time I checked, the kid in front of you is sober. And comes to you every day and is sober. Five hours, that, who you, that is who your client is. Okay, that is who you need to pay attention to. People, I think what, here's my advice to you. I need you, as staff who are working with many of these adults who are challenged, it's like, just because you're special ed doesn't mean you grow out of it. People have a hard time understanding that special ed adults are one special ed children. How can we teach, how can we treat special ed children so much nicer than we teach special ed adults? I never, I never figured that out. I think, here's, here's, some, here's the advice I would give your staff. There's got to be some parameters. Absolutely, you've got to have some parameters. But I think we all need to treat people kinder than necessary because you never know what, what, you never know what burdens they're bringing. And that makes you the bigger person. And it's hard being the bigger person. Have I been small? Absolutely, and I'm embarrassed about it. But I think we have to realize that in order for us to make this world better, and to make change in those adults' life, we have to change. And then I would have this really hard conversation with staff and saying, this is the direction we're going. This is our client, this is our clientele, these are our people. If this is not a fit for you, I will help you find a place that's a better fit. But that takes courage as managers. And we need to have courage that we've got some people in places it's not a fit. Like Michael, you would never put me in one of the Christian schools. <laughs> Probably not. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. Okay, poor Michael. Okay, you're not going to put me in, you're not going to make me the, I'm not a good fit for a principal of a Christian school. <laughs> that only makes sense. Just like you probably wouldn't want to put me in a school with very wealthy people who are complaining their kid lost their leather glove. I'd say, you're that stupid to buy your kid a leather glove and he's age seven, right? There's places that are better fits for us. As I said, I've been so fortunate in my career that I've worked with boards and I've worked with, with HR people and bosses who've said, you know what, wait us, that's not a good fit. <laughs> this is a better fit. I'm not everyone's cup of tea. Okay? That's okay. I don't want to go around having everyone approve of me. Okay? In a perfect world, it'd be nice, but I'm secure enough to know it's not going to happen. You may have to have that conversation with staff. Okay? God, God help us. Most of us are not. One out of four people in this room is going to face some kind of mental health issue. One out of four of us. Anxiety, depression, other stuff. So what gives us the right to be so bossy that we think we're so damn special? Because we're not. And so I always say, and one of the people that I've, and I've learned so much, I got to work with someone, she's now an assistant <coughs> superintendent, she left Edmonton Public, and she's with uh, St. Albert Catholic. Her name is Colleen McClure. And I'll always remember, this is what a really good moment for me. We were in Fort McMurray, <laughs> and we had gone up to Fort McMurray and had went to speak to someone in their school jurisdiction um, whose expiry date had come. Okay, expiry date had kind of come. Uh, but she, and I'll always remember, when's the last time you saw someone wear a Fort Trail? Like it wasn't even bad polyester, it was Fort Trail. Anyway, there was this gal and she came, she, we were dealing with this person, she was kind of high ranking. And uh, we'd say yes, she'd say no. We'd say one, she'd say two. I'd say up, she'd say, yeah. and it went for like an hour, hour and a half, and it was hard, okay. Anyway, we leave the building, and I'll always remember Colleen McClure turned to me and she said, I look at that person, I wonder what happened to her. 
What happened to her? Where did she lose her dreams? Did the system fail her? Did the school district fail her? Did a boss fail her? Did a friend fail her? How did she fail herself? That she would be somewhere at this point being so negative and cross. And I can remember saying to Colleen McClure, Colleen, that is what a loving person would say. Yeah. <laughs> Here's what Sandra Wade is like. But I think we have to step back, and I'm not saying we're all going to turn into Gandhi, because it's impossible. Okay, we're not all Gandhis. But I think we have to look back and say, you know what? Can I cut this person some slack? But there also has to be a line in the sand. Okay, when they're spitting at you, okay, if they're spitting, if they're being really verbally abused, so there has to be some conversation. That's you're making a poor choice. Either you three think your choice or you may have to leave this place for a period of time. That's common civility. That's manners. That is plain old fashioned manners. Um, I just find we're real I just find that I think being poor is hell. It's hard work. Very little it's not too it's not great being poor. And uh, probably uh, one of the best things I've learned is the resourcefulness and the resiliency from many of the single moms I've worked with. I've, wor I've learned lots of stuff from single moms um, who are, you know, trying to craft themselves out a living, raising kids, not getting any support. Does that answer you? Yeah, it's great. Thank okay, you. but I think your managers also, okay, the people who are in charge also have to have some hard conversations with people. Can we quote you? Oh, God. Can we yeah. dedicate a slide? Okay. Okay. Well, I don't care what he wants, okay? And I, I, can, I can even work with you. Oh. Okay? For a cost. <laughs> We're doing it for free. This is my haul. I've taken a day. I've taken a vacation day to be here this morning. Okay. Yes, go. Um, you mentioned that you like to put people in tight shorts. Well, get their shorts tight, yeah. Get their shorts tight. How do you go about it? when you're making them feel uncomfortable, but do it in a way that they want to go with you and not stress them out, like add additional health issues. <laughs> okay, I'm okay. Yeah. I'm not, okay. Yeah. Um, I'm in the people development business. Okay, my, I think my job is to develop people. When I was a supervisor, my job is to develop people. My job is to develop myself, develop people to be the best they possibly can. Okay? I think sometimes we look at people and we look at them as to where we'd like them to be rather than where they're at. We get into trouble, Mr. HR Policy 56937, <laughs> that we're asked to evaluate people all the same way or treat people the same way. Okay, we're not, but I'm just making fun of you because you're Mr. HR, you've got all those rules. <laughs> uh, I think we have to look at where people are, where people are at, not where I'd like them to be. I think I also have to I also have to step back and say, how would I feel if I was going through this? What kind of empathy can I have? I still don't think we have it with this and I can we cannot not allow we gotta keep we can't let people off the hook. We gotta so it's gotta still be accountability. But we have to make sure what we're asking people to change is worthwhile change as well. Sometimes if any of you had to do some stuff that you look at it and you think, what the hell are we doing this for? Oh, never, not under Pilar's. <laughs> <laughs> okay? It has to make sense. I think what happens is you, you, accept, you, you, you accept people from where they're at, not where you'd like them to be. I think we also have to remember that, that change happen, builds, builds the same way that muscles do, and that's very slowly. And how best can I identify? How best? I, and I think probably the best thing that's helped me be is, uh, and I think I'm a good supervisor of people, is what's helped me be a good supervisor. I was once a classroom teacher. I once taught special ed. Not saying all adults are special ed. <laughs> I'm saying why it helped me is because when you looked at how the best can I help the kid, you kind of had to look at the kid and think, what are the strengths? Where's the weakness? What kind of program do I have to build it around? And we also have to know, and I really believe in reinforcement, and I really believe in the power of reinforcement. I think we are in desperate need of good leadership that tells us we're doing a good job. And not only are we telling people that they're doing a good job, but we've got to make it specific 
immediate and relevant. And I'm talking about taking the time to say, like I'm, you're talking about um, you cute little girl in the pink. What's your name? I'm Suzanne. Suzanne? Okay. Um, what you were talking about, like how, how, how do you get people to take a change without getting stressed out? So what you have to look at is, as, as, my, as a people de a developer, what do, I've got to catch you being good. I've got to catch you doing what I've asked you to do. That's part of my job. We do that. It's called good teaching. It's making sure I say, you know, I, it's, I, you know, here's what I see you doing. This is showing me that you're making an attempt. How can I help you? Is there anyone here that can help? There are we too. There's still some people that old style leadership who believe that by by being difficult and being a bully is going to change people's behavior. It does not change people's behavior. What changes people's behavior is that we help them identify what their strength is, and bit by bit we reinforce, we work with them. And there also comes a time where maybe it's just not where you should be. And having that courage to say, you know, I don't know if this is what I want. I'll give it a good, you know, I'll give it that try, but to make, to make that decision. There, like I know, like I've been so fortunate that I have been in places where I know my strengths are going to shine. But I also know where my strengths won't shine. Having me write policy, heaven forbid. Having me write, you know, action requests, that's not where I, I could I do it? Yeah. Would I, would I really shine? No. Is there other places for me to go? Does that help you out? Is someone making you stressed and crazy? <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Not yet? Come work with me for a while. <laughs> but I believe in having that fun as well. Having that fun as well. I do law, I try to really reinforce the behavior I want to change in myself, as well as the behavior I want that I want to help change in staff or in making a move as an organization. Other questions? <laughs> wow, that's good. Okay. <laughs> I guess they all want to go home. I don't know. About you. Okay. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> Have words after that. I really want to thank Sandra. Oh, this is great. Thank you.